Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Uh, give me a call, 208-991-4783, and uh, become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Well, this episode is brought to you by the financial support of our listeners. Thank you so much for all of your support. I uh, also want to especially thank Erica and Lisa for sending along their donations. And as we do with all donations of $7 or more, we'll send along access to our premium site. Uh, and on our premium site today, we have our second Agatha Christie app special. Uh, the ABC Mysteries were originally a, a Poirot a mystery story. However... Uh, the, it was done on suspense without Poirot or a real strong detective lead. So you get to, uh, experience the ABC murders. It's kind of like Poirot without Poirot. So, uh, for those of you with the premium site, that's available. Uh, well, we're going to take a look at another episode of Murder Clinic. Uh, last time we played Murder Clinic, it was on our 550th episode special. And in that uh, special, uh, we played in, uh, the episode The Scrap of Lace with Madame Rosica's story. Now we have a Poirot uh, Murder Clinic episode. Uh, this one is uh, actually one of five that were adapted uh, Agatha Christie stories. Uh, others were done with Parker Pine and Miss Marple. Though there were three uh, Poirot uh, stories. One I personally would like to hear, because I like the uh, uh, story with be- the Yellow Iris. But the one we have is The Tragedy at Marsden Manor. And the other one's The, uh, the Triangle at Rhodes. This episode stars Maurice Tarplin as Poirot, Tarplin is best known as the uh, narrator on that horror anthology show, Mysterious Traveler. But he was also a novelist and very just well-respected in the radio uh, field. But anyway, from, uh, from October 6, 1942, is The Tragedy at Marsden Manor. Murder Clinic. Stories of the world's great detectives of fiction. Men Against Murder. Each week at this time, WOR Mutual turns the spotlight on one of the great figures of crime detection and brings you his most exciting case. Tonight, Agatha Christie's unique detective, Hercule Poirot, in the tragedy at Marsden Manor. Evening, Monsieur Poirot. I'd recognize you anywhere, I think, thanks to those magnificent mustachios of yours. Merci bien. They are very magnificent, no? They are indeed. Tell me, did they help you solve the tragedy at Marsden Manor? Uh, no. It was the little gray cells in the brain of the great Hercule Poirot that prevented this great miscarriage of justice in the death of Richard Maltravail of Marsden Manor. It all began in the little village of Marsden Lee, less than a hundred kilometers from London. Coming? Coming? Yes, yes, what is it? Be you Dr. Bernard? Yes, I am. Come quick, the master's done for. You mean Mr. Mellon Travels of the manor? Aye, the master. The mistress, she says, fetch the doctor, she says. But there been no use. He's a dead un. I know the dead un when I see him. What was it, then? An accident? No, beat no accident. I found him in the lower meadow, with the blood running out of his mouth. Be a stroke. A stroke? That's what it be. Well, hurry, man, hurry, man, let go. Come, come now, Mrs. Beltravers. You must get hold of yourself. The Lord give it and the Lord take it away. After all, we are all of us mortal. Why, Richard, he 
He was so good, so kind. Why did this have to happen to him? Oh, come, come, please. He seems so well, so full of life. Why, only last week he passed a medical examination for insurance. How could he have died so suddenly? Doctor, what happened? A hemorrhage due to stomach ulcers, undoubtedly, resulting in a stroke. Mr. Hyde. Hello, Farrow. You know my good friend, Captain Hastings, no? Good morning, Captain Hastings. Good morning, sir. Well, Farrow, you got my message, I see. I did. What is it that disturbs you, mon ami? Oh, it's your Maltravers dies. You sent for Poirot. What was the cause of Monsieur Maltravers' death? The death certificate says a hemorrhage resulting in a stroke due to stomach ulcers. But surely you did not bring Papa Poirot here to talk of the stomach ulcers. He's Richard Maltravers that... Taken out the insurance policy in your company, no? And what a policy. For 50,000 pounds? Well, a good square sum, that, eh? Huh? Hmm. Rather. So, what is it you wish me to do? It is unfortunate for your company, but everything seems, uh, how you say, uh, open and above the plank, no? <laughs> no, Puerto. Open and above board. Ah, my good friend, the great Hastings. Always he corrects the English of Hercule Poirot. <laughs> Monsieur Wright, I ask you, do I not speak the English of a, of a super? <laughs> you do indeed. But to get back to your previous question, what my company wishes you to do is to investigate the circumstances of Mr. Maltravers' death. So, what is it you suspect, mon ami? Well, of course, you know in the case of suicide, the policy is invalid. Yes, and when a man past the prime of life takes out an unusually large policy in favor of a young wife half his age and then dies within two weeks, the possibility of suicide cannot be ignored. Oh, the certainty, mon ami. But suicide by hemorrhage? That is a queer saucepan of fish. Now, if the cause of death had been heart failure, ah, then I would smell a mouse. Heart failure can always mean that a, a stupid doctor did not find the true cause. But hemorrhage? Ma foi, hemorrhage is, well, uh, uh, hemorrhage. Exactly. <laughs> Nevertheless, we are determined to proceed with the matter. You will undertake the inquiry? But of course. Hastings, that great professor of English, shall go with me. <laughs> eh, mon ami? <laughs> Gladly, for uh, Eh bien. Now, where is this place, this Marsden Manor? You take the Great Eastern Line from Liverpool Station to the little town of Marsden Lee. Marsden Manor is about a mile from the village. Mm, Marsden Lee. All right, Hastings, we go. Ah, well... So this is Marsden Lee, eh? <laughs> I hope we can get a conveyance up to the manor. Ticket, ticket, sir. Ah, uh, you are my friend. I suppose you'll be coming down for the funeral, sir. Funeral? Uh, what funeral? Uh, you say you made a funeral of Master Maltravers. About oh. the manor. Oh, uh, you say the manor. Uh, could that be Marsden Manor? Aye, it be. That is a not coincidence. Uh, my friend and I, we have come down with a thought of uh, buying this Marsden Manor. You couldn't pay me to live there, you couldn't. Why not? It be haunted. Haunted? I haunted. Seen things there, folks, says. Yeah, we shall see. Now, could you tell us where a Dr. Bernard lives? I, up yon hill, about half a mile. There. Come, he stinks. <laughs> Then, Dr. Bernard, that you signed the death certificate of a Mr. Richard Maltravers. Yes, I did. You understand, Doctor, with such a big policy, we must make the careful investigation. Of course, of course. I suppose he was such a rich man, his life was insured for a big sum. Hmm? You consider him a rich man, Doctor? Well, was he not? He kept two cars, you know, and Marsden Manor is a pretty big place to keep up. Mm. Although I believe he bought it very cheaply. I understand he had had uh, considerable losses of late. Mm, is that so? Indeed. Mm. It's fortunate for his widow, then, that there is this insurance. Yes, yes. Very beautiful and charming young creature, but 
terribly unstrung by this sad catastrophe. I've tried to spare her all I could. But of course the shock has been very great. Why shock? These ulcers of the stomach, uh, they are what uh, you call chronic, yes, eh? yes. They are not sudden. No. Did you not attend uh, Mr. Maltravers before, Doctor? My dear sir, I never attended him. What? I understand Mr. Maltravers was a member of a faith healing sect. But you examined the body? Certainly. I was fetched by one of the undergardeners. And the cause of death was clear? Absolutely. There was blood on the lips, but most of the bleeding must have been internal. He had not been moved? No, no, the body hadn't been touched. He had evidently been out shooting crows, and a long-barreled bird gun lay beside him. The hemorrhage must have occurred quite suddenly. Gastric ulcers, without a doubt. He could not have been shot, huh? My dear sir, I beg pardon. But I remember once a doctor who said heart failure until the constable showed him a bullet wound for the head. Mm, you will find no bullet wounds on the body or head of Mr. Maltravers. Now, gentlemen, if there's nothing further, uh, I... Thank you, doctor. Uh, uh, just one more thing. You saw no need for the autopsy, huh? Certainly not. The cause of death was perfectly clear. In my profession, we see no need to distress unduly the relatives of a dead patient. Now, gentlemen, if you'll pardon me, good day. Well, Hastings, what do you think of our good Dr. Bernard? <laughs> Bit of an old fool. Precisely. Your judgments of character are always profound, mon ami. Except Thanks. where a young and beautiful woman is concerned. So now you must uh, mind your Q's and P's. Because the good doctor has said that the next one we see is both young and beautiful. This Madame Maltraver. Madame Maltraver, I cannot tell you how I am sorry to bother you in this way. Must I be bothered now? I know nothing about this insurance of my husband. Courage, madame. It is necessary. I will do all to make this matter not too unpleasant for you. I, Hercule Poirot, swear it. Now, if you would recount briefly the sad events of last Wednesday, huh? Well, I was changing for tea when the maid came up. One of the gardeners had just run up to the house. He'd found Richard. No, oh, I can't comprehend. Enough. <laughs> you had seen your husband earlier in the afternoon? No, not since lunch. I'd walked down to the village for some stamps. I believe he was out pottering around the grounds. Uh, shooting the crows, no? Yes, so I understand. He usually took his bird gun with him. In fact, I heard one or two shots at a distance. So? Where is this bird gun now? I, in the gun cabinet over there, I suppose. With your permission, madame. Yeah, here it is. Ah. Two shots fired, I see. And now, madame, a delicate question. Monsieur Maltravers, your husband, is awaiting burial, I believe. Yes. He's lying in his room. Uh, if I might see? Why, yes, of course. It's the, the first room at the top of the stairs. You'll forgive me if I don't go with you. What, of course. Hastings, you remain here with madame. Do you think Mr. Poirot will understand why I didn't go with him? Oh, I can assure you, Mrs. Maltravers, Poirot is most sympathetic. I don't doubt it, Mr. Hastings. I only wish there was more that I could tell him. Oh, I understand. And I wonder, Mrs. Maltravers, if you could tell me one thing. Oh, yes? Well, the station master, or an odd character named Volk, said something about Marsden Manor being haunted. Marsden Manor haunted? Why, surely you're joking, Mr. Hastings. Oh, no, no, I assure you. He told us that people have seen things. We must have been referring to my, my humble experiments in extrasensory perception. I've always been tremendously intrigued by that subject. And doubtless some of our servants have been gossiping. Madame, you are mediumistic. How fascinating. Oh, I wouldn't go so far as to say that, Mr. Poirot. I've dabbled a bit, that's all. So? I've managed uh, table levitation and simple things like that. Hmm. But I suppose to the simple rustics around here, it looks like black magic. Very interesting. Under kinder circumstances, I would implore a demonstration. Why, are you interested in such things, Mr. Poirot? All fields of knowledge interest the great Poirot. Uh, Poirot, don't you think perhaps we'd better... Oh, I, I forgot, madame. Uh, I thank you for your so great courtesy. I do not think you need be bothered any further by the matter. Uh, by the way, do you know anything of your husband's financial position? Nothing, whatever, I'm afraid. 
I'm very stupid about business. I see. Then you can give us no clue as to why your husband suddenly decided to insure his life. Oh, was it sudden? I'm sure I don't know. En fait. And now, with your permission, madame, we will go. They think? Oh, uh, I'll see you to the door. Merci. Oh, uh, just one more thing, madame. Could you tell me, when they found Mr. Maltravers, did they find him unshod, uh, without the shoes? Why, really, Mr. Poirot, I, I don't understand. <laughs> it is nothing, it does not matter. And now, madame, adieu. Oh, but look, you have another visitor. Someone is coming up to walk, huh? Archie! Hello. You! Why, I, I thought you were on your way back to Australia. Yes, I was. But I read the news of Uncle's death in Paris and hurried back. Emily, my dear, is there anything I can do for you? Anything? Oh, of course not. What could you do? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting. Uh, Mr. Poirot, this is Captain Black, my husband's nephew. Uh, Captain Black, Mr. Hastings. How do you? Emily, how did this happen? Uncle seemed perfectly well when I was here Monday night. You've evidently read the papers, Archie. You must know what happened. But they gave no details, just the bare notice of his death. What happened? Archie, I... I just can't go through all that again. Yes, Captain Black, I'm afraid my friend and I, we have disturbed, madame. What are you doing here? I am Hercule Poirot. The Hercule Poirot. Uh, Mr. Poirot is from the insurance company, Archie. That's just why I've come back. To protect you from annoyances like you this. You shouldn't have risked your job, Archie. If you left right away, you might still get to Paris in time to make your boat train. Uh, you say Paris, mon capitaine. You go to Australia by way of Paris? Why, yes. I intended taking the Orient Express from there and pick up the Pacific Mail at Port Said. Ah, oui. That shortens the journey, does it not? You are staying here, Captain Black? Yes, I'm staying at the Pig and Thistle. That's the inn down in the village. Ah, village inn. It serves the roast beef, no? Why, yes, I suppose so. Good. So, Esting, let us try this roast beef at the Pig and Thistle, huh? All right, Poirot, now you've had your roast beef. Hadn't we better be getting back to London? No, not so fast, my good Hastings. London, she will not run away. But this Captain Black, he may do so. A garçon, garçon. For heaven's sake, Poirot. English inns don't have garçon. No? Then who is it who approaches? Warrior, Cavani. For my friend, the dictionary. For me, a, a, a bock. <laughs> he means beer, George. I mean the ale. Right, oh, Cavani. Uh, you've been up at the manor, sir? I. I mean, yes, we have. It's sad business, that. I knew no good had come of it as soon as they took the man in. Uh, you mean this, uh, Maltravers? Uh, they were not popular? Well, uh, not that, Governor. He was a bit too old for her, if you know what I mean. Oh, see. She might better have married the nephew. At least, way, so I better bob the nephew thought so. Ah, there has been the gossip, huh? Eh? Oh, I wouldn't go so far as that, Governor. But he did hang around a bit. And the husband, uh, Mr. Maltravers? He object? Not as I know of, Gaffney. But why is my opinion, I am? Mm, without a doubt, it is the worst opinion, non, George? But, ah, the Captain Black, here he comes now. Hello, Poro, here you are. Uh, Captain Black, uh, come, will you not join us? Uh, Bark, perhaps? Yes, thanks, I don't mind if I do. Wait, a mug of ale. All right, Captain. Sad business, this death of your uncle, huh? Yes, and so sudden, too. He seemed in excellent health when I dined with him Monday night. So? And was he also in good spirits? What did he say? Or what was the talk at this dinner Monday night? Oh, I don't know the usual general topics. I see. My uncle asked about my people. We talked of Australia. Yes. Then Mrs. Maltravers asked a lot of questions about East Africa, where I've spent some time. I told them one or two yarns. That's about all, I think. Madame Maltravers uh, seems much upset at the death of her husband, no? Naturally. They've been married less than a year. So I hear. A remarkable woman, this lady. Remarkable in what way? What do you mean? She has, uh, how you say, the seeing eye. I hear her tell Hastings. She does the seance. He seems most interested, no, Hastings? Oh, I, I wouldn't go so far as that. Uh, always the conservative Hastings. Me, I, I am not so. Well, Mr. Poirot, don't tell me you believe in this psychic stuff. Oh, I have not a closed mind. For example, Captain Black, you have told us 
all that your conscious self knows. Now, with your permission, I would question your subconscious, huh? Psychoanalysis, eh? Well, it's nonsense, but I don't mind. Merci. It is like this. I give you a word. You answer with another word. Any word. The first word you think of. Eh bien. Shall we begin? Go ahead. Hey, things. Note yeah. down the words, please. Oh, very well, Father. Now. Day. Night. Name. Place. Bernard. Shore. Monday. Dinner. Journey. Ship. Country. Uganda. Story. Lions. Bird gun. Fun. Shot. Suicide. Elephant. Tusks. Money. Lawyers. So that is all. You are a good subject, mon capitaine. You don't mean to tell me that rigmarole means anything to you. Maybe not. But nevertheless, you are a good subject. <laughs> well, if you don't need me anymore, I think I'll go upstairs and unpack. Shall I see you again before you leave, Mr. Poirot? Yes, I should not be surprised. Good. See you later. Au revoir, mon capitaine. And now, my clever estes, you see it all, no? Well, I don't know what you mean, Poirot. Does that list of words tell you nothing? Uh, sorry, I'm afraid it doesn't. Then I will assist you. To begin with, the capitaine answered within the time limit. No pauses, no making up the mind. Mm -hmm. Day to night and place to name are normal associations. Then I give him Bernard, the name of the doctor, if he knew him. Oh. Evidently he does not. When I say Bernard, he says sure. Monday means dinner, country is Uganda. Story recalls the lion story, he tells them. All uh, natural. But now, notice. When I mention bird gun, I get the unexpected answer, farm. When I say shot, he answers at once, suicide. A man he knows commits suicide with a bird gun on a farm somewhere. <coughs> Imbecile that I am! The great Hercule Poirot is... Is hoodwinked. What are you talking about? Do you not see Hastings? That is the story the Captain Black told at the dinner Monday night. Oh, I see. And you think that gave Maltravers the idea? You think he shot himself in the mouth with that bird gun? Why not? Remember, the bird gun has a very tiny charge of powder. The bullet would remain lodged in the brain. All that would show would be the blood in the mouth. Come, Hastings. It is not too late. Of course, but, but where? To see once more this dead man to Marsdon Manor. Hastings to Marsdon Manor. Alas, Mrs. Maltravers, it is true. Your husband shot himself to the mouth with the bird gun. You mean suicide? It would seem so, madame. The insurance. Naturally, madame, the suicide will void the policy. It is unfortunate, but huh, what will you? Oh, but this is impossible. My husband would never commit suicide. It's, it's inconceivable. But the evidence, madame, it is conclusive. No, there must be some other explanation. You mean uh, murder, madame? Well, of course, that is always possible. But no, no, not likely, I'm afraid. But you do admit it's possible. You just said it was possible. Yes, of course, everything is possible. Have you any idea who might have wished to kill your husband? Why, no. No, I haven't. Madame, I have a suggestion. It is bizarre, no doubt, but perhaps if you are willing to help. Oh, yes, yes, of course, anything. Madame, you are mediumistic. Perhaps if you would try... Perhaps you could... you're right. Perhaps I could get through to Richard... He might tell us what happened. I am sure you could do it, madame. Yes, yes, I'll do it. Uh, come back here tonight at eight and bring Captain Black with you. Eh bien, madame, I am sure you will succeed. Until eight, madame, au revoir. Hello? Du Bois Theatrical Agency? Henri Du Bois. And this is Hercule Poirot. Bien, mon ami. Henri, I have a part for you. For one appearance only. Oui, oui, as always. Now listen closely. This is what I wish you to do. Dr. Bernard. 
sure Mr. Maltravers after this talk. Did he have on the shoes? He did? Bien, merci. Hello, Scotland Yard. Inspector Jap, please. Hello, Jap. Uh, this is Poirot. Quite well, thank you. Inspector, I think I have a murderer for you. No, no, there is no time to explain. Be at Marsden Manor, Marsden Lee, at 8 o'clock tonight. Wait outside the window. And do not come in until I call, eh? Good, remember. Marsden Manor, at 8. <laughs> We are on time, as you see. Hastings and I have brought Captain Black with us. I say there's a bad storm coming up. Would that interfere with the experiment? Certainly not, Mr. Hastings. This isn't mumbo-jumbo. The weather has nothing to do with it. Well, well. Let us proceed, huh? Uh, yes, yes. Now, uh, will you draw chairs up around this table, please? Uh, now, Mr. Hastings, if you put out the lights. Certainly. Now, remain perfectly quiet, please, no matter what you hear or see. Richard. Richard. Can you hear me, Richard? Can you hear me? If you can, rap. Rap three Times. Did you hear that? Ah, but of course, madame. Did you not tell him to rap three times? That's how Richard always used to knock. Perhaps he is outside. No. They say the suicide never rests, always returns. Listen. What was that? The front door slammed. What? No, Captain Black. It was but the thunder. Where are I? I hear footsteps. It is the wind, madame. I will close the door. Ah, I have locked it. Uh, don't do that. If it should open now. What ah! Jove, it is open. He's there. There in the doorway. I see nothing, madame. I saw him, I tell you. My husband, you must have seen him too. Look. She's right. He is there. His hand. Look, it's pointing. What's that light coming from? Pointing at her. What did you... Her hand. Her right hand. It is scarlet with blood. Blood! Yes, it's blood! I killed him! I said take him away! Take him away! Light! Good heavens, Poro, she's got away through that window. Do not worry, mon capitaine. The good inspector Jap outside will stop her. Good heavens, that, that lovely creature, a murderer. And a very clever one, my susceptible Hastings. After all, she could not know she would come up against the great Hercule Poirot. And she might even have fooled me if she had only taken off his shoe. A shoe, Poirot? Only with his toe could he himself have pulled the trigger of this bird gun. And par bleu, his shoes were still on when they found him. But I don't understand. This seance, was it all fake? Mais certainement. She meant to pull the sheep. Ah, uh, wool. Very well, wool. But it was I who pulled the sheep's wool over her eyes. Thanks to my good friend Henri Dubois, who played the part of the husband's ghost, and Papa Poirot, who put the red paint on her hand in the dark. But what was her idea in having this seance? Par bleu, mon capitaine. Do you not see? Madame, she will go into the trance. She will hear the voice. She will come out from the trance. She will, with the great reluctance, name the murderer. You mean she meant to confess? Mais no, mon capitaine. She meant to name you. You have been listening to Murder Clinic.
Murder Clinic, the WOR Mutual Series, which brings to you each week one exciting case. Tonight, the tragedy of Marsden Manor, with Agatha Christie's unique detective, Hercule Poirot, played by Maurice Tottenham. Next week, Murder Clinic will bring you Fred Irving Anderson's Deputy Farr, the Vermont farmer who became chief of the Homicide Bureau in New York City. Deputy Parr, the man with the nose for murder. The story is Gulfstream Green, in which the deputy proves that the conceit of murderers is colossal. Original music was composed by Ralph Barnhart and conducted by Bob Stanley. This program was an international exchange feature over the coast-to-coast network of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Tales told on Murder Clinic are adaptations by authors Lee Wright and John A. Bassett. Murder Clinic is produced under the direction of Alvin Flanagan. Frank Knight speaking. Welcome back. Well, Tarplin's French accent sound, or Belgian accent, sounded really French. Uh, but I guess it was good enough for Americans in uh, 1942, kind of in the middle of World War II, early part of it. So probably most hadn't uh, heard a Belgian accent. But anyway, that'll actually do it for today. We'll be back tomorrow with Let George Do It. And next week we'll get into the first of uh, nine episodes in Poirot's own uh, radio mystery series for Mutual. In the meanwhile, your comments are much appreciated at Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and give us a call 208-991-4783. But from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off. <laughs>